Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another serving of Business Soup Talk Radio. If it's in business, it's Business Soup. I'm your host, John Dibbavoise. Here at The Soup, we like to fly with the eagles so that you can soar with the elites. I'm talking about Thelma Landorian from Elite Tax Services. She's a CPA, and we're going to be talking about small business mistakes. What are you doing? What is your neighbor doing? What are you doing to cause you to lose money by not doing what is legal, moral, and ethical? That's taking all that you can in deducting from your tax liability. You can do it, I do it, everybody can do it. We're gonna be talking about those mistakes and how converting ordinary expenses to deductions is done and depreciation schedules right here at the table on Business Soup. Telma, welcome to this serving of Business Soup. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You are one of the experts that I love to surround myself with, and that is all about taxes. I love to talk about taxes because as a small business owner and my audience of small business owners, we love to talk about how to save money. It's legal, it's moral, and it's ethical to minimize your taxes. So let's start talking taxes. You have been a CPA and a tax expert for many years. What are some of the most common small business mistakes that we do? You know, when do we step on our shoelaces and fall down on some of the most common mistakes? Great question. As far as small business owner, usually what I see is that most people are interested in generating revenue and whatnot and entity structure and tax planning is the last thing they think of but when it comes time for them to actually report their annual revenue or gross and whatnot they are not prepared to deal with that at year end and so one of the most common mistakes that i see most people make is the entity structure and entity selection and they think that if um, they go on a legal Zoom or whatnot and create an LLC, then they actually are in business and everything is set up. But lack of entity structure, how it's going to affect them between what else is going on in their life and if there is a other source of income, if they're filing jointly or not, these are all questions that need to be answered. And I think entity structure, uh, that's where I would usually like to start covering that aspect with my clients. One of my other favorite subjects are the entities. The first thing that most people do is if they actually file a DBA, good for them, but oftentimes they don't. And many of my listeners are home-based businesses. They operate from the kitchen table to start off with. You know, I started out in a barn. Didn't smell as good as the kitchen <laughs> table, but that's where I started with. So when you start off, what are some of the things that I should be doing that so many people that start a business, what are some of the key things that they should do coming out of the gate? One of the things I usually ask is that, what do you think your projected gross revenue is on an annual basis? And I usually like them to be realistic. Obviously, everybody wants to make it in the first six months, first eight months or whatnot, but that doesn't happen. And so, like you said, if it's a passion and then eventually it becomes a, a profitable business, at that point, they need to really stop and think about what they're actually doing. I had a client, um, we actually spoke last year. He came to me and he's like, tell me I'm buying a RV park. And I think we're going to be doing about 50,000 as far as gross. And so at that point I was like, uh, let's meet in six months and see if you're actually there. So being realistic, having your numbers, record keeping, all that really becomes part of the discussion for you to use it as a stepping stone to what type of entity you need to create. And the entities, as you guys know, we have c -Corp, we have s -Corp, we have LLCs, we have partnerships, and there are different things for everybody to really consider. But the first thing is that, yes, entity structure is important, but be realistic as far as what you're going to be doing. On the other hand, I have entrepreneurs want to be that they have their logo set up, they have their letterhead set up, they have their website set up, but they're generating zero income. And so they're basically stuck in this mentality that everything has to be perfect. So it has to be really a well-taught process is that, okay, let's push this 
passion to profit process forward, but check in and see, am I profitable? Am I making money? And it, it, if you're at 20, 30, $40,000 profit margin, then at that point, you really need to stop and understand the entity options that you have, and then get to talk to an expert and have their opinion and really set up the entity as it needs to be. For those who are working out, as I gave that example of the kitchen table, how important is it to separate the business expenses from the personal expenses and the use of the credit cards and bank accounts? Is that muddy water when it comes to an audit? Absolutely. And it's not only just because of the audit risk, it's going to be high, but most often it's the opposite. It's the deductions that they're not able to take because it's not clear. And they think that they're being smart or, or they think they're being clever by, you know, okay, I'm going to take this card and I'm going to use it for this personal reason. And there is no clear division between, okay, this is the personal side and that's my business. But most often they actually hurt themselves, but not clearly defining those lines. At the end of the day, what we find is that there's about 60 to 70% deduction that they could have taken if they had the bank account set up, if they were actually using the correct bank account for their business use, because when things are muddy, you're actually losing on the deductions that you can take. Yes, there is an audit risk, but actually you're going to overpay in taxes because you're not taking the proper deduction. Well, I have discovered in my years that the IRS can't persecute you for being a bad business person, but they can prosecute you for being a bad record keeper. So what you're saying, keep business and personal separate. What are some of the record keeping things that I can take that I'm currently doing personal that I can now swap over, considering that I've done all the right things, I've lined everything up on the right-hand side, which is my business side, and the left-hand side of the kitchen table is the personal stuff with the milk and cookies. On the right-hand side, what are some of the things that I can convert into deductions that were normally ordinary expenses? If you're in a business entity, you can very well take the office expense and make it deductible, even though it might be your kitchen table. But in addition to that, if we do the record keeping process properly and do the planning properly, in addition to that, you can actually rent your home up to 14 days and not pay taxes on it while you're shifting income from your business to your personal. And so there are things that you can do if you do have that separation properly defined. The easier ones are obviously the mileage, where's your home office, because if you define your home office to be your residence, then the mileage that you take from going from your home to your uh, office depot or home depot to pick up material that becomes a deductible uh, mileage and so forth. And so depending on the line of business you're in, if you're in real estate, if you're actually operating a small business out of your home, there are many deductions that we can take in addition to the obvious ones that would bring your taxable income down. A lot of the CPAs recommend, oh, it's a year end, so go purchase that truck. And I was like, okay, well, if you do do that, uh, you're actually really not tax planning because now you have to pay that payment to GMC financials instead of to IRS. That money is still going out. So that's really spending money doesn't mean that's actually tax planning. So there are different strategies we can put in place to reduce your taxable income while you still have access to cash. We're talking with Telma Lendorian. She is with the Elite Tax CPA, and we're talking about my favorite subject, or one of my many favorite subjects, and that is the conversion of ordinary income to deductions. And one of my favorites, other than my horses and cattle, are my kids. I hired them from a young age. I had to fire my daughter twice on her lack of talent of putting stamps on envelopes, but I was forced to rehire her each time. At what point can you turn these kids into uh, deductions? Is there a, a minimum age and function? Great question. One of my favorite strategies. You technically can hire your kids. And as far as the age limitation, as long as they can follow direction, 
they you you can <laughs> make them work and they can actually follow directions then you can have them be employed by your company you can hire them under your s corp that wouldn't be the best strategy usually what i have my clients do is create a family management company which is just really a bank account that does the management and then under that family management company then you can hire your kids as young as 6 7 years old up to 18 uh, you can actually pay them about 12500 obviously if they turn into time sheets record keeping is absolutely a must and there must be actually reasonable compensation. They can help you with marketing. They can help you take out the garbage in the office. They can help you paint the renovation you're doing on your fix and flip. They can do a lot of things. But as long as they provide uh, with a timesheet, you can hire them and up to 12500 You can pay them and there would be no taxable event. Basically, it's again shifting income from your S-Corp to the family and by doing that, because that becomes an earned income, it's my absolute favorite because they can actually invest that into some kind of an IRA and let that grow tax-free. So it's um, one of the great strategies out there. It is a great strategy as long as you treat them as an employee and you pay them on a regular basis. What about retirement plans and college savings? Basically, what you're doing is that you're taking your money at a higher tax rate and you're plowing it towards your kids. And I strongly suggest you don't tell your kids that they have this money in a bank account. Right. <laughs> and then you pay their bills, as I did. Or you pay their bills through that bank account. That's the beauty of electronic banking. And they're not even aware of what you're doing and building a great credit history as well. So you can plow just about any amount of money through the bank to pay the expenses that are directly affiliated with them and call that a salary. Absolutely. As long as it's reasonable, as long as it's documented well, you can absolutely do that. And again, um, you know, when, when you do put it in some kind of retirement, because it's earned income, it's going to grow tax free or you can use it for their summer camp or you can use them for because they're minor, you still have control over their bank accounts and whatnot. So that's right. It is absolutely under your provision how that money needs to be spent. Well, I wrote my kids off. It didn't motivate me to have any more, but I stayed with two. <laughs> now, in your book about tax savings, which you have called the black book for the real estate investors and developers, you have a, a passion for real estate, as do I. And there are so many people out in the market right now that are real estate agents and brokers, and they're having a wonderful time with multiple offers and everything is selling. What are some of the tax strategies that a real estate salesperson can be doing if they're operating, for the most part, out as an independent contractor out of their house? As long as the state allows, I encourage all of them, as long as they're making at least 50000 or more in gross um, commission. And like you said, this year it's been interesting year for a lot of business owners. I would encourage them absolutely start an S-Corp. And by doing so, they can take a reasonable salary out of their S-Corp and be able to take the remaining uh, with saving about 15.3% in self-employment taxes. And so that's just the basic that goes to any business owners. But as far as real estate is concerned, I encourage them to actually buy a piece of property as an investment property because they are in the known. They actually see the properties that are doing well and they can actually start a rental uh, portfolio. By doing that, they can take advantage of the depreciation. As you know, we have two options for the depreciation. One is the straight line, the other one is the accelerated depreciation. And so by purchasing real estate, now you're able to use the deduction that depreciation generates, offset your other income as long as you are deemed to be a real estate professional. And so that's a great strategy that a lot of my clients do use specifically if they're real estate professionals. I am familiar with all of those, and I recommend everybody follow that. Some of the do's and don'ts of accounting, it's really an accounting project, and you have to have accurate records, and technology has afforded us the ability to keep accurate records. 
Telma, I'm going to take you out to lunch and we're going to talk about taxes and I want to write that off. Can I do that? Absolutely. How much of it? Well, it depends. As far as the meals uh, and entertainment was eliminated, uh, but now with meals, I think we can do the 50% of that. But if it's within the premises of the actual business, that's 100% deductible. And so it's always there. You can definitely take advantage of that. Is there a drink limit that the IRS has to it? <laughs> as long as you're not driving, I don't think there's any limit to that. <laughs> We're talking with Telma Landorian of the Elite Tax CPA about taxation. If you'd like a copy, an ebook version of her black book for real estate investors and developers, well, you know the website. That's bizsoup.com. Go there and you can check out not only this show, but its transcript and a link to getting that ebook brought to you by Business Soup. Tell them, what are some of the most overlooked deductions that a small business would have? There's the automobile, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but are there depreciation schedules on that kitchen table that I'm working from that I can create, or is that taking it a little too far? Well, again, there is a way to do it the right way, and there's a way to not do it the right way. So you always have to be on the reasonable side. So if you're making $100,000 in net profit, I don't want you to be depreciating that or renting that out to zero by creating a hundred thousand because it has to be reasonable. So anything and everything that's done, obviously you need to have the tax code behind it, uh, but also make it reasonable. And as long as you stay within that parameter, you're safe. And also you're actually taking advantage of things that are available. As far as uh, overlooked deductions, I think we covered the hiring the kids strategy. There is um, one strategy that I love, which it's the Augusta loophole, that it allows you to take 14 days out of the year and rent an asset and be able to deduct that from your business. And even though you are going to receive a 1099 because of that deduction, it's an in and out on the tax return. So you report it as an income, but it's excluded from being taxed. So actually I had a client a couple of days ago, he has acres of hunting land. And he was like, I never use that. I never actually charge my clients that go there, but it's an expense because he personally owns that. So what I recommended for him to do was to be able to actually rent 14 days out of the year and S Corp basically pays him personally for that rental. And that's a shift of income strategy from your S Corp to your personal without making it a taxable event. Well, I would do one up on that. And I would tell my friends, here's a subscription model. And every, every month you pay me X amount of bucks and you collect on a regular basis. That's passive income and you get access to that property. So we can redefine that or sharpen that tool. The only thing is that the limitation is, is very clear. That has to be 14 days or less. If it passes that, then it becomes a rental asset and then different rules apply to it. So oh. you have to be very clear on that part. So before you take John's advice, talk to Telma. <laughs> so depreciation schedules. I always like depreciation schedules. And I go back to the years long, long time ago where they had double declining depreciation bases, which made apartment buildings, brand new ones, very popular. And I was selling a lot of those in my early days of getting involved in real estate. And they took that advantage away, like Reagan took away the three martini lunch. What are some of the depreciation schedules that I should be using on, well, let's say I'm a restaurant owner. I have my trade fixtures. I have the personal property and there's, there's real estate. What are some of the areas that I'm eligible to depreciate and what kind of tables can I use? Sure. So depreciation, like I said, being in real estate industry mostly. And again, you know, real estate is interesting because as soon as you start having a profitable business, is it a restaurant or are you a medical or you have a medical practice? You know, you could have any, any different type of industry, but also have a, a real estate on the side. It's almost, it's a common denominator for a lot of business owners because they do invest in real estate eventually. And so 
I would say as far as real estate goes, we do, for the depreciation schedule, we do actually in-house a lot of cost segregation studies for our clients that do have real estate, which gives them the accelerated depreciation schedule, allows you to depreciate uh, your asset in a shorter period of time instead of waiting 27 and a half years if it's a residential real estate or 39 and a half if it's restaurant or if it's commercial type building. So we do use that strategy quite heavily. Almost 80% of my clients do use that strategy and we do the cost segregation uh, studies in-house and we provide them with the actual schedules that they need to file with their tax return. But we also have the 179 rule and things like that, that you can actually, I think in 2020, because of COVID, a lot of new things came about that you can actually depreciate. And again, don't quote me on that because I need to check my notes on it, but you can depreciate up to a million dollars this year if it's depreciate 100% of it. So it's a pretty, you know, there are a lot of ways for you to take advantage of it. And if you're going to have a, a profitable year, but you still need that piece of equipment that's worth 50000 even if you finance it and you pay only $1,000 into that, you can depreciate all 50000 of it and reduce your taxable income this year for it. So there are many de- depreciation rules and codes that are available in addition to what's really came to be under the COVID situation we're in. We're talking with Telma Landorian. Now, Telma, what I like about the tax code is that the legislators will create something, but most of them have no idea on how to run a small business. And then when small business gets their hands on the tax code, they go, ah, I can figure this one out. And then the legislators come back and cry foul and say, well, that's not the spirit of what we intended. Case in hand was, I think, back in the 2000s, I remember that you could buy a piece of property business-related and deduct the entire expense up to $100,000, and it came out. Well, all of a sudden, you saw all these Hummer H1s, these military Hummers on the road, because there were a lot of businesses that, well, I don't need to buy any equipment for my business, but I would always wanted an H1. And the legislators came out and said, well, that's not what we wanted, because you can't get a more indifferent vehicle to uh, climate change than an H1 Hummer. So you're talking about that you can you can go out and buy a piece of equipment, financed or not, up to, and I hear you correctly, up to a million and then write that off in the year of acquisition? For 2020, yes. That's a heck of a deal. You know, it's not the rich man's, poor man's tax code. This is the same tax code. And I hear this all the time about paying, well, that's a rich man's so-called tax code. No, it's one tax code. And as I have famously said and in, on this show as well today, it's that you don't have to know the tax code. You just have to know how to use it. And folks like you know how to teach us and show us and help us use the tax code. And one of the biggest misnomers that I see is the vehicle deduction. People think that, well, I'll just arbitrarily pick a number. You know, it's like throwing a dart and I'm going to deduct that number of miles. What is the official way that the IRS will allow you to deduct your mileage or use of vehicle and depreciation of that vehicle? So as far as vehicle goes, there there are two ways for you to take advantage of the car deduction or if it's a truck or if it's used for business. I'm assuming, let's say, let's let's put the first assumption in place that it is actually used for business, right? It has to be because you can't really take it if it's not used for business. But let's just say that's already been hashed out. It is for business. So you can actually do the actual method or you can do the mileage. You can't do both. Actual means if you go and take the car or the truck for oil exchange, that becomes whatever the expenses, you take that deduction 100%. If you do that, then you cannot really take the mileage deduction. Or you can say, no, I actually do lots of driving in a given year. So that's the route where I'm going to go. And so the first question I usually ask is like, do you actually drive a lot of miles? If that's the case, then let's go with the mileage. But if you don't 
and your office is down the road, maybe the actual cost is the right way to go. Again, it depends on the nature of the business as long as it's reasonable. And if somebody comes back and asks you a question, you can actually back your decision making, even if it's within the range, you're in a good shape. And so um, one thing you mentioned earlier, I think it's worth noticing is that doing your tax return and taking it to a CPA, an EA, or filing your return is just a compliance. You're basically dealing with filing as if you need to renew your license every few years. That's just a compliance. If you hire a, uh, a, a tax preparer to do your taxes, you're not actually saving on taxes. You're not actually planning your taxes. They just take the information from you and then they complete the return and that's the end of it. Now, it becomes your responsibility as a business owner to really be proactive and put a tax plan together. And obviously, if you're running your business and you're wearing 10 different hats, that's really the least thing you want to do. So I usually tell my clients is that do a tax plan once every few years. You don't need to hire uh, us. We're advanced tax planners, but you don't need to hire us to do your tax return per se. If somebody else can do it, let them do it. But at least you know the options you have. You are going to be asked the questions that usually the tax preparer who's charging you a couple hundred dollars is probably not going to spend the time to do it. They just do the compliance. Right. And they're lining the numbers up in the correct order and they're not planning out your taxes. They're just taking what I give them and putting it on paper, signing it, saying they prepared it and submitting it and not truly taking advantage of the tax code. Hence, we're talking with Telma. So, Telma, tell me. <laughs> we were talking about the vehicles. There's the actual, and then there is the, the mileage. Nowadays, with technology, I have an automatic GPS system that comes on when my vehicle starts up, and it's asking me, hey, where are you going? And it's tracking my mileage date and, and giving me a timestamp, and I can choose yes or no if it's personal or business. Well, I love this because in, in my old days, I used to take out a little piece of paper and write it all down, and then I'd have to transpose it and all of that. So I've always been very fastidious about keeping track of the actual mileage. Is that a better way to do it if you drive a lot of miles? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to bring up another point. Uh, technology these days are there for you to take advantage of. You just need to know what to use. Uh, probably what you're talking about, and there are many of them uh, on the market. Mileage IQ is a great app for you to use to track your mile. As you were saying, you know, it will ask you, is this a business mile you're doing? And all you have to say is yes or no, and it does it for you. You don't even have to worry about it. At your rent, you just basically run a report. It tells you exactly what the mileage was. Doing it manually, it's always, you actually miss on opportunities that you think, you, oh, I'm gonna just add another 500 miles here and there. You think you're actually ahead of the game, but you're actually missing out a lot because you don't always track things. So using technology, setting up things, you know, earlier you asked what's the, what are the things that the business owners don't really take advantage of. Set up online QuickBooks. It's not a rocket science. Put yourself on a payroll. Nowadays with Intuit, you can actually, with, with QuickBooks, online, you can actually do the full service. They take care of your taxes. They take care of your quarterly filings and whatnot. So use technology, use different apps. And if you don't use it, then you're going to actually miss on a lot of opportunities. Well, missed opportunities is a loss of money, whether it be deductions or income. I've been talking with Telma Landorian of the Elite Tax CPA. And if you'd like a free ebook, Ready, folks? It's tax saving for the black book for the real estate and investor as well as developers. There you go. You can go to bizsoup.com where all business goes for business. Check out the podcast with Telma and you will find not only the transcript, but the link to her ebook. And it's brought to you courtesy of BizSoup and Telma Landorian. Telma, thanks for being on this serving of Business Soup. I appreciate it very much. This has been another serving of Business Soup, where business comes for business. 
I'm John Debevoise, inviting you to visit the website for more servings of what is best in business. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com.